Hello and welcome to today's program, The COVID Impact, Sports, Entertainment and Music. In today's environment, where children are home and a significant portion of the workforce is working remotely, there is higher utilization of internet servers impacting bandwidth. We appreciate your patience and understanding should any unexpected technical issues arise. As always, it is our intent to give you the information you need as seamlessly as possible. Disclaimer, this program is intended for informational purposes only. Nothing should be construed or taken as legal advice, and any information, questions, or discussion should not relate to any client matter or issue that may be considered privileged or confidential. If you have questions, please type them in the questions area and click send to submit them. The presenters will answer your questions during the Q&A. At this time, I would like to introduce Gio Ninan, one of our moderators for today's program. Gio, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Uh, hi all, welcome to today's webcast. We're so thankful uh, to have a really great group uh, with some awesome experience in several sectors including sports, entertainment, music, and media. At the outset, I just want to point out that the uh, South Asian Bar Association of New York, uh, which Poonam and I are officers, are so thankful to Greenberg and its entire tech and marketing team, including uh, Paul Starker, who's uh, been instrumental in getting this uh, event together. The South Asian Bar Association of New York, or Sabini as you may know it, is a volunteer bar association geared toward diasporic South Asian lawyers in the greater New York area. Sabini provides fellowships, it provides a pro bono clinic um, and programming that helps membership uh, and some of the most vulnerable uh, populations in the greater New York area, especially uh, at this time when uh, COVID is impacting uh, um, a significant portion of uh, the South Asian community uh, in Queens. With that said, I wanted to introduce myself. Uh, I'm the managing partner of Shunker Nine and Co. I help small to medium-sized businesses, businesses in uh, outside general counseling and litigation uh, essentially, uh, when small companies uh, have a stretched legal function or a, uh, a non-existent legal function, I'm um, their go-to. Uh, my co-moderator, Poonam, works at uh, Louis Brisbois. Poonam, uh, can you introduce yourself and what you do? Thanks, Gigio. Hi, I'm an associate at Louis Brisbois. We are a national full-service law firm that has recently been ranked number seven on Law 360's largest firms list. I'm in the general liability practice group specializing in construction and New York labor law. Defense work, I'm honored to be here co-moderating this panel with our esteemed panelists. That include Kumal Patel, Council of Vice Media, Paul Sarkar of Council to Greenberg Troy, and Kristen Surya, Director of Business Legal Affairs at Atlantic Records. Uh, Kumal, please tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for being here. I, you know, like Putin said, I'm Council at Vice Media. I've been here been there for about uh, two years now. I do production legal for the U.S. and then kind of everywhere considering, you know, Vice is, Vice is a little bit crazy, but um, I did that. Uh, and before that, I was a Universal Music Group. And before that, I was at Max the Magazine. Thanks, Paul. How about you, Paul? Uh, sure thing. So I'm Paul Sarker. I'm counsel in GT's New York office. I work in entertainment and media and also touch a little bit of sports. We do distribution for television, streaming services, and the music, and other and digital apps. Uh, we do production work and um, a lot of content creation representing companies big and small. And then we also do a lot of uh, work in the media and entertainment space in, in terms of M&A. So that has, has slowed a little bit, but that's something we do a lot of. And prior to joining GT, I was in-house at Marvel and Disney. Last but not least, Kristen Syria. Hi, I'm Kristen, uh, Director of Business and Legal Affairs at Atlantic Records. Uh, you definitely know some of the artists that we have, uh, like Cardi B, Lizzo, Bruno Mars. Um, you know, basically what we do as in-house attorneys is we sign new artists, we, we do the artist deals, um, and then we manage our own roster of artists. So that's my day-to-day -day work, um, which is really cool. Um, and before coming to Atlantic, I was at a, a small boutique music law firm, Carol Guido Brothman, Cohen Barr and Corellian. Um, where I was mostly working on the artist side of, of the same work. So doing, you know, uh, record deals, producer deals, clearing albums, music publishing work. Well, thank you guys so much. 
Um, I guess we're going to just hop right into the questions now. How has the uh, shutdown and the quarantine uh, impacted clients? Uh, are, are there areas that the work has actually increased for you guys? And we'll start with Paul. Uh, yeah, it's a great question. So I think the the main the, the the word I would use would be uncertainty. I mean, the shutdown came with such little notice, and it was so widespread across the globe. There was really no way to sort of predict how that would happen or, or how it would play out. Uh, and that's had uh, impact in terms of public health and scheduling events and activities have been canceled. And that's led to a real shift in asset values and uncertainty in how you value assets. So if you're buying companies or looking at businesses, uh, you know, the, the opportunities or the deal flow has slowed and there's lots of people scrambling to reschedule things or put things on hold. And just figure out, you know, what the, and I'm not a fan of the phrase new normal, but to figure out what the new normal is. Uh, two areas that I've seen really increase are uh, streaming and music streaming services and audiovisual content streaming services and gaming. And I would include esports and gaming. I think those businesses are just taking off right now. And now uh, we'll go to Kristen next. Sure. I mean, I think, as, as Paul noted, obviously streaming has had a huge surge. I think for us on the recorded music side, you know, that's always great news. We love to see streaming numbers going up. Um, but certainly in terms of music as a whole, uh, you know, the live music industry is, is right now completely at a pause. And, and initially when we all went home, um, everyone was really concerned because especially the summer season, the spring season, that's festival season, you know, touring season, a lot of artists have had to cancel tours, cancel shows. Um, and in terms of, of how you reconfigure that, that's certainly affected my day-to-day -day workload. And, and just because everybody wants to do a stream now, like everything has been sort of like shifted to not just necessarily like uh, DSPs like Spotify and, and Apple Music, but also like uh, transitioning what used to be, you know, a, sh a tele like a, uh, not a television show, but like a like a live show, like a performance, to something that people can watch on their computers or on their smartphones at home, um, you know, on Instagram or uh, TikTok or whatever it is, whatever the, whatever you're doing that's live. So certainly clearing those and and then also finding new ways to engage with fans and make up for those live tour merch sales um, that that come in. Um, that's definitely been a big shift in terms of both promo and, and, and artist engagement with their fan base. And Kunal? Yeah, I was trying to think, I was trying to think about this. I had spoken to, to Paul about this initially, like when I think when we had first met and the pandemic was just hitting and I had said, I got busier for some reason. Um, what, even right when it hit, like production took a second to slow down um, at Vice and the gift and the curse of Vice is that we can move really quickly and we oftentimes do move really quickly. Um, so even with all the uncertainty, we just kind of switched to remote shows. Um, we switched to trying to create as many different concepts as we could remotely um, and, and how we could do that. And then something else I saw that, that really, um, I guess started happening was repurposing old content and trying, and that, you know, involved a lot of work trying to figure out, can we even do this and put it on TikTok? If we do that, is that going to be an issue? Like all sorts of things like that happened. Um, and so it was uncertain. It, I mean, it's still, it's still uncertain, but for some reason I found myself getting, you know, super, super busier. Um, and I think that probably, everyone probably felt that in waves, like everyone going to work from home at the same time is probably, you know, so many different disparate personalities trying to figure it out. Thank you, Pingal. So, I'm a huge sports fan, so this next question is uh, geared specifically to uh, Paul. All right, so I see that uh, you know every single professional sport, and I know you represent a ton of professional sports teams. Uh, so uh, I see that every single professional sports team has a, a different way of implementation their return to play. So um, what is your experience in uh, in that, and, and and how are these different professional sports teams, um, you know? Uh, trying to get back to play and, and having the owners make money and the, the players make money, et cetera. Sure. Well, you know, I feel like we could do a whole panel just on this topic. And, and so I say when this, when we first started in March, uh, no one knew it was going to happen. And there was a sense of dread. The NBA postponed its season March 15th. And now fast forward three months, 
things are looking more optimistic. The NBA has a plan to return to a, a condensed bubble type environment at the end of July and, and, and have 22 teams playing. The NHL is going to be restarting training camps in mid July. And the, NB, the MLB is sort of circulating a proposal between the owners and the players union to resume a 60 game, to have a 60 game season. Uh, but that hasn't been finalized. And the NFL hasn't actually announced any changes to the schedule. And so that remains, it remains to be seen whether that season happens and whether it can pull. The only thing they've announced is that, you know, training camp and all the team off-season activities are going to be vir- are virtual. So, you know, I think there's a lot of uncertainty, but now there's optimism. And certainly the, the broadcast agreements are a large source of the revenue. And if there aren't games happening, uh, there's, it's a, typically a financial calculation. It's a force majeure event, and there's a formula in the contract that has to specify, you know, if there's reductions in fees, when they would be payable, and how they'd be calculated. So we just, you know, we help our clients work through that and and try to plan around what might happen. But if anyone said that they had a certain view of the future, they'd be they'd be lying. Following up with that, what are some of the concerns that? your clients face um, regarding returning to work um, in each of your prospective fields? Let's start with Kunal. Yeah. Um, hmm. I mean, we work out of a warehouse in Brooklyn. Where I work is in Brooklyn. So just getting all of the teams back um, in there is a concern that everyone's working on right now because I don't know that it's physically possible for the workforce that used to be there to come in. Um, you know, legal, for instance, we sit in like a glass room. So that's just not going to, it's just not going to work. It's kind of like a slow, you know, slow glass room, a uh, little, little small glass. Room. So that's a, that's a big concern of how to phase in the people that really need to be there. Like, you know, the colorists, the editors, the different studios that we have, how to phase in getting talent to come in and make sure everything is safe, make sure everything is clear. Like we're working on guidelines for that. A lot of those have been put into place. Um, that's on that's on our end. Yeah, I think I think that's that's probably the big concern right now. Like nobody's like Paul said, like nobody's really certain what's going to happen or how it's going to happen. I'm sure mistakes are going to be made like initially, uh, and we're all just trying to sort of figure out where the big glaring red flags are right now. Kristen, I think you know for us, there's really two sides. Um, you know, I'm speaking us like like recorded music in general there's or at least record labels in general I think there's the side of of how do we get the business moving and then also how do we get the music moving um you know from our perspective at least as a company what uh, what I've seen is the uh, the last few months everyone has kind of been like okay how do we get and make sure it's safe for people to continue recording music um our artists to continue recording music and also for them to be doing like you know uh social distancing safe things like shooting videos, um, live streams, and, and kind of confirming that we can do all of that within a socially distant environment. Um, and then eventually, uh, in a few months, we're going to talk about, you know, bringing everybody to work. But from the business end of it, like, you know, most of us are able, luckily, to do our jobs from home, like as lawyers, lawyers certainly in the legal department, um, but even other people, you know, in other departments, marketing, promo, um, things like that, we're able to kind of communicate um, virtually uh and and use computers for advantage that way it's the the trickier angle is is certainly making sure that artists are able to continue to seamlessly create content and then that we're able to adequately promote that content and make sure that there's fan engagement audience engagement with that content thank you paul uh yeah i would i would echo that i'd say so the the primary things that are being balanced are health and safety concerns. Uh, nobody wants uh, another spike. No one wants to lose loved ones. No one wants to get sick, along with the sort of widespread acceptance that, uh, uh, you know, the shutdown is kind of economically unsustainable. So businesses have to start making judgment calls as to what can continue remotely without a drop off and, you know, perhaps work better and what needs to happen in a more office or or collective setting, you know, like live shooting or production, shooting a movie or a television show, that that can't be done remotely entirely. Maybe some editing can be, and maybe the writer's room can be remote, but if you're going to have to be on set to make a movie. So 
um, with that tension, you know, there's a balancing act. And then there's also following sort of the CDC guidelines for reopening and best practices. And then various states are implementing phased approaches to reopening. So, for example, New York has divided the state into regions and there's four phases. Phase four is actually the final phase, which covers arts, entertainment, and recreation, as well as education. No region of New York is in phase four. Uh, New York City is in phase one. And if there's an increase, if, if as we reopen the economy, there's an increase in cases, Cuomo's reserved the right to either stay in phase one longer, or if we step into phase two in New York City and the cases go up, then maybe we go back into phase one. So it's going to be a measured approach. California, similarly, has recently restarted uh, allowing productions to film. And and they're implementing best practices, as, as we all described, like trying to find low-hanging fruit, social distancing, COVID testing, temperature testing, having a task force appointed officer, having medical resources and training, uh, staggering the um, the work schedules for people, and also, you know, one casualty I think is going to be the buffet lunch is probably a thing in the past. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to circle back to something that uh, Paul said uh, earlier uh, related to what he's dealing with with the return to play, which, which is uh, the force majeure clauses. Um, how are each of you uh, guys uh, dealing with the force majeure clauses and have you guys been implementing them uh, in your contracts going forward? And are there are you guys doing it differently? Are, you, are there like virus clauses, contingency clauses? Like how are you guys implementing this for each of your uh, respective industries, whether it be the sports for uh, Paul, uh, for Kunal, you know, how is Vice doing it for their, you know, for production, et cetera. And, and, and same thing for you, uh, uh, Kristen, how are you doing this for your uh, live performances, et cetera, going forward. How are you guys implementing this, and are you guys? And I'll start with uh, Kristen. So actually, it's interesting because, I mean, I I just left the artist side of of you know of the music business, and now I'm I'm at a label where I'm actually very insulated from having to deal with that. Like usually, that actually kind of falls to the artist attorney, and I have a lot of friends that are in the artist attorney world, and I know. <laughs> that suddenly like the second week of March everyone was looking at their SM clauses and it was really like I mean like it, I'm laughing about it because there's nothing like there's absolutely nothing funny about it it was a panic situation but but I mean to say that like in me in my current role I'm not I'm really like you know I, I did that was not something that I had to deal with at all because really we're only dealing with the records as, as they come in and and live performances to the extent that the record company has has rights to that that side of uh, like 360 rights so um in terms of what needs to get canceled and and all of all of like the 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 mess around that um god bless the artist attorneys of america because i was not doing it thank you Kristen. uh Kunal. Yeah, I mean, I think I kind of I, I kind of share what Kristen was saying in that before the pandemic, I, I can't I don't remember the last time somebody said force majeure outside of law school. Like I have no idea the last time I heard that in a negotiation, no idea the last time where I was like, wow, I really need to check out that force majeure clause like that. That didn't really happen. So going back to when, you know, I was saying vice is kind of a gift and a curse without quickly move the minute we realized that these clauses might you know, become activated, we kind of across the diff, you know, legal across our different uh, business units, we have to just look at the clauses and decide, you know, what's the risk here if we can't, if we can't uh, execute on this, or if the other side, you know, won't let us or, you know, something, you know, if we can't perform our obligations, or if the other side can't. And so we had to do that. And then at the same time, um, you know, I'm working with our sales and branded attorneys as well. And at the same time, we're just creating language uh, that we now use in contracts going forward. And for the most part, you know, it's, it's worked actually with our clients. Like there hasn't been much pushback in terms of adding, you know, a call out, a specific call out for a pandemic or, you know, cause everyone knows COVID. I think everyone realizes like COVID probably falls under an act of God, but we, but we call it out anyways now. And then, you know, we add in a little bit of leeway for, you know, let's all basically, you know, and legally is just saying, like, let's all work together. And if we can't, then there's possibly a kill fee based on, you know, how, you know, how big the client is, how important they are to us, things like that. And, 
everyone's been pretty, you know, pretty understanding about it. But I, I can't say I was dealing with it before. And, and I'm glad that I don't have to like do too much craziness with it. And everyone's been kind of okay. Um, and Paul, you? Yeah, uh, once again, I'd echo, I'd echo that. So, you know, when we're negotiating deals, you know, we have our clients typically negotiate the business terms and, you know, the dollars, the years, the exclusivity. And we don't, you know, force majeure, as, as Canal said, is not typically a heavily negotiated term, but it is a very important term in certain circumstances. And so in this pandemic, there's been a renewed focus on the force majeure provisions. Um, oftentimes, in certain contexts, like lease agreements and vendor uh, equipment agreements, there aren't force majeure provisions just because that's not the standard. So um, sometimes you're operating in a contract in a contractual setting that doesn't have force majeure language, and maybe at that point you're relying on some common law doctrine of impossibility of performance or trying to resolve things on a relationship level, realizing that, hey, you know, we may not have a contractual solution on this, but you don't necessarily, you know, I can't afford to pay you right now. My business is shut down, and you may not find someone else that can fill my shoes in the next couple months anyway. So why don't we just try to work something out on a business level? Uh, and then if you do have a contractual language, then it's like, you know, looking very, parsing the words very closely to see, you know, what's, where's the governing law? Do courts construe the clauses narrowly there or, or more broadly? Um, what does the actual language say? Is it an act of God? Is there a catch-all category? Is there a laundry list of items? And if there is a laundry list, is pandemic included? And what sorts of things uh, would, are you, re, 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 like, are you trying to, Force performance or excuse performance, right? Because, you know, at a firm like GT with so many clients, we often have clients that, you know, would want to excuse performance or would be on the opposite side of that. So, you know, we don't take a position either way as to whether or not the pandemic is a force majeure event. Given the circumstances and our client interest, we can argue either result and, and try to, you know, create the best argument based on the language that exists. But there are certain best practices that we'd want to implement for sure. Thank you. Um, has there been an increase in production claiming particular items are, you know, fair use to respond to the need to turn things around quickly? Uh, how are your businesses tackling an influx of content that may or may not be infringing? Um, let's start with you, Paul. So, um, I was hoping I wouldn't get the fair use question. So, here's what I'd say. Fair use is a very nuanced, fact-specific analysis that I uh, would typically reserve for the experts, and GT has copyright experts that look at fair use and will do the deep dive and, and look at all the facts and determine whether or not it's a colorable argument or whether there's a good, a good chance that you prevail as that affirmative defense or you know, on the grounds of, hey, we didn't get a copyright license, but we're, we think this is a fair use for X, Y, and Z reasons. I don't typically get into that, like I said, because it's a minefield. Um, what I would say as far as like the general takeaways is, you know, our advice as transactional lawyers is when in doubt, get a license. You know, if there's any uncertainty, it's probably better to just reach out to the copyright owner, get a license and have that predictability. And if you are going to go the, force, the, the fair use route, I would say do your homework in advance, run the analysis, call an expert and, and make the most compelling case you can because it's probably better to get ahead of it than to try to do try to re respond to a letter or some sort of claim where, you know, you'll have to pay, you know, it'll be expensive and you'll be scrambling to, to sort of resolve it. So that's kind of the extent of my fair use knowledge. I know there's like a four, several factor test, but um, it's not really my area. Thanks, Paul. Can you add to that, Kristen? I, I mean, you know, I think from, from our perspective in the music world, we would be very apprehensive of, any kind of you know derivative or or you know any kind of sampling we're always on the lookout for that like that's probably you know a, a, that's like a large part of part of our work um is kind of to make sure that we have every button is buttoned and and everything is is free and clear for us to to be able to exploit music um and i think you know it's an interesting thought that that covid might have somehow uh, created a situation where there's more or less of that but to be honest with you i think it's it's about the same like you know like clearance meetings and and like artists are going to sample if they're going to sample or they're not going to sample if they're not going to sample people are going to borrow shit and steal shit and interpolate excuse my language <laughs> but you know what i mean like it, it's i don't think that there's been any greater increase in that um 
just by virtue of uh, of of being at home. But I will say that you know, from the standpoint of of people having to do things like shoot videos and stream things that from from their own homes, we have like been a little bit more vigilant about things like okay, like you know, what's this rare poster that's like in this artist's house, you know, like, you know, are they wearing this like amazing custom jewelry, you know, like things like that, like small, small kind of like, are you holding a hot sauce bottle, you know, like with a brand name on it, those kinds of things. Interesting. No? Yeah, I mean, um, for me, I guess, b- being being in production, um, and needing such quick turnaround, we, you know, Vice has you get really pretty risk tolerant advice to things like fair use um, and making analyses pretty quickly. Um, but because of, because of the pandemic, I found that that's kind of ramped up. Like a lot of the production teams, you know, they're just like, we don't have the time we can't, and we absolutely need this. Like we have to do this. And so, you know, it's definitely, it's definitely become a point of contention. Like there's certain things we don't do. Like Kristen, we're not taking music. I swear to God, we're not taking music. But um, <laughs> but I'm always like, please don't. Like please don't take music. But uh, you know, it, I do feel like it's ramped up a little bit during the pandemic, only because we just have insane turnarounds now. You know, they're they're just trying to produce entire like 30 minute episodes, and they're finding elements from all over the place. And I just have to me me in particular. I just try to mitigate the risk as much as I can. Like like Paul said, when in doubt, we license. Um, for the most part, it works. But I feel like I have seen an uptick of just let's just take stuff from everywhere because everyone's scrambling. You know, it's kind of getting, it's kind of slowing down a little bit now. But um, it does feel a lot more than, than before when we had like weeks of pre-production and we had time to do things. Uh, what parts of your industries are well suited to grow once the pandemic subsides? Let's continue with you, Camille. I think. I mean, I think we, you know, I, I guess I keep saying this. We're we're able to do really quick work, but I think that's gonna that's gonna become that's gonna become a real focus going forward. That like people now know how quickly we can put something together, um, especially the shows that we have success with. Um, so I see that kind of going, you know, going forward um, as really being something that you know, we're going to, I feel like we're going to see, and I'm already starting to see like more requests for deals, more requests for like talent deals um, and for things to happen that before it might've been a little bit less. And now it feels like, you know, it feels like a lot more. Um, so I think that's, that's definitely an area that's going, and we, you know, and we've shown that whether it's remote or whether it's in person, we're going to figure out how to do it, you know? So I think production as a whole, we're going to be good. Awesome. Oh, I think, I mean, I'm actually, and I said this to a friend of mine, I think within two weeks of us going home, I'm just so excited by the creativity that I'm seeing, you know, from our artists, um, you know, from people that are, you know, like, I think we've seen video production be as creative as they can be. Like, I was watching a music video yesterday to prove that someone shot from like six feet outside of an artist's home. And I'm like, that is not something like, you know, that's an obstacle that we would have previously called unnecessary, but it looks beautiful. And, you know, it's it's really interesting and exciting to see like what people are doing. And I think that that's certainly going to lead to creative growth. And then I also think that there's definitely going to be a space because it's going to be a long time from, from now before we probably start seeing artists doing, you know, live work again, that there's going to be a huge explosion of of artists doing things via live stream. Um, and it's just inevitable. They're already doing it. There have been artists that have been doing it for, you know, even before COVID happened. Um, but I think we're going to start seeing uh, seeing that become a much cooler and, and innovative space, which is, you know, it's, I, I, like as somebody who's not a professional creative, like I think that's, that's always the best part of the job. Thanks, Kristen. Paul? Yeah, I, I would agree with all that. I mean, I think uh, certainly things are going to, things like production are going to adapt. Uh, and I think within entertainment, streaming, gaming, esports, TikTok, social media, and really anything that is sort of decentralized that you can either monetize uh, through a cashless transaction and reach reach into someone's house or subscription location directly, or that you could, you know something that enables end users to create content and monetize it, you know like streaming via YouTube or Twitch. 
I think those things are poised to really grow. And they were growing before the pandemic. I think they'll just get stronger as a result. I mean, if you look at esports in particular, um, esports is not a new thing. And even in 2018, 2019, the growth of esports was catching the attention of a lot of traditional live sports. And now, because it's not impacted by the same health concerns, um, the popularity is just going through the roof. And as they get more engaged, not as, as fans get more engaged in transition, it, they're not going to go away. So yeah, anything that can be done remotely, I think is poised to do well. Okay. So um, building up on that, what lasting changes do you see in your industries um, that you think will happen as a result of the shutdown? Um, Kristen? I think, you know, definitely the live space is going to be different. I think, you know, everything about how artists are going to be engaging with their fans is going to be different. Um, luckily, I think as lawyers, I think we all know this from ever having tried to go on a vacation, even pre COVID, like the work is always there. It never goes away and it never lets up and you're always working. So um, there's just going to be new iterations of that. I saw one of my friends sent me a, a photo of like an artist who had done a concert, like where everyone was in bubbles. <laughs> <laughs> which I think is fascinating, but like, you know, I think there's definitely going to be a lot of not only innovation, but a lot of uh, change, certainly, in how we approach um, live music. Um, and then, uh, you know, on the record side, it's it's, it's certainly going to be great because streaming is going to go up. Yeah. Thank you. Paul? Uh, yeah, I, I agree. So I would say there's probably three areas that are going to be significantly impacted. Concerts, live events, as Kristen said, uh, sports with fans, and uh, the theatrical. Uh, and I think, like I said, there may have been forces in place, market forces that were impacting theatrical and sort of the rise of streaming prior to the pandemic. I think they'll probably be accelerated. I think with concerts, as, as Kristen said, it's going to be a while before um, concerts as we know them and live festivals would are going to return to prominence. Uh, you know, maybe there's a, there's a lot of uncertainty uh, as far as when we'll have a vaccine and if, the, if there's a vaccine, will it be, you know, available widely and will it be effective? And even if that, those things are true, will people, will there be the same demand? Will people want to go to a festival with 250,000 other people, you know, and, and, and potentially risk exposure that way? Or would people feel comfortable having uh, their temperature checked at every time they, they walk in and out of a venue? Um, so things like that, I think, are going to have lasting impacts. And until there's some sense of expectation as to when that will resume, it's going to be hard to book uh, live back and because they're not going to know what the revenue side of their equation is. Their cost side may be relatively certain and maybe even go up because of the protective measures or the best practices they'll have to implement. But if the demand isn't there, then maybe it doesn't make sense to do a world tour. Or maybe it, it, it changes in some way. And even if you did solve those things, it's still hard to get venues because there aren't that many venues to host, you know, 25,000 person events. And a lot of them are also used for sporting events and all the sports seasons have been shifted. So there's just so much uncertainty. And in addition to that, there's the unrest, uh, you know, the widespread protests and, and social unrest that's impacting not only creators of content, athletes, it's also impacting fans and, and our communities. And it's a conversation that needs to be had and I'm not saying it's a bad thing we're just going through a transition I don't think people know what it's going to look like on the other side of this with regards to like large mass gatherings. Thank you. Kunal? Thank you. Um, you know as lawyers definitely I feel like all of us can work from home and hopefully like that will that will become a more widespread thing um, just in a curse with all that you know entails where you might just be working until God knows when in the evening and stuff, which we already do anyway. So I see that. Um, and then, and then, uh, you know, like it was said earlier, I just see people getting more creative. You know, I, I see our production teams just trying to figure out how to shoot interesting content, which everybody wants to stream now. You know, you, you, you have them now. You have like a captive audience, right? Um, and so we, we don't, you know, advice, we don't really deal with live events per se, but production is, it requires going to locations and figuring out things and, and, you know, being within CDC guidelines and, and stuff like that. And so I just see them getting way more creative, going to different, going to different locations that they wouldn't normally do before. I mean, I used to be able to walk out 
uh, in, on South Second in Brooklyn and see our teams, you know, filming random things on the street. Um, they're no longer doing, you know, stuff like that. They might be going further somewhere. I, I think I had an idea come across my desk yesterday about filming on a kayak somewhere on the Hudson. I'm not sure how that's going to happen, but like, you know, things like, you know, things like that are, are going on. And I see, uh, you know, I see that as a positive. Just to piggyback on this question, uh, and this might, this question might only be relevant uh, to Paul because he does uh, the live events, but uh, it, it could be relevant to everyone. So have you guys, how, how have you guys seen technology be implemented, like, you know, um, uh, to substitute for like live events? Like, have you guys seen like VR technology for sporting events or theater or uh, music events uh, that are coming into play now? Or is that still um, on the back burner for, for now? Uh, we'll start with uh, Kristen. In, if it's not relevant, you can just say that and then we'll just keep going. But I know, I think Paul might have some experience in them, but I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, go ahead, Paul, you go ahead. Well, so, I mean, I don't have a, actually a wealth of experience in the area, but I do know, uh, you know, Apple bought this company, NextVR, earlier this year. Uh, maybe they were doing some pandemic bargain shopping or, or whatever, maybe a strategic purchase, or maybe it was planned before. So NextVR, I think, is integrating an experience. They were working with the NBA. I think they're also working with the MLB to create, like you said, they, they have the very sort of cutting edge futuristic cameras and their headsets that, you know, if you have them, you put it on, you'll feel like you're at an event. And so when you can't physically be at an event, maybe it's the next best thing. I don't think, uh, I, I don't know that anything has been announced as far as what, whether they're integrating with the NBA and it's restart or the, or the um, MLB, but certainly it's something to keep abreast of. And it does seem like a natural fit, but it won't be the same as, sort of eating the popcorn, sitting in the stands and, you know, having that, the social aspect won't be there, but maybe it'll be just as compelling from a fan perspective. But you, Kanal, do you have any experience in how, like, technology is being implemented in your respective industry? Um, I think you were, you, were, you were saying specifically, like, VR, right? I, I'm not going to lie. I don't think we, we haven't, I haven't seen anything come across just yet about VR um, in production. That being said, you know, the, the teams are getting increasingly good at figuring out how to, you know, how to film things remotely, you know, whether it's, whether it's via a drone or whether it's via having people, you know, use their laptops and all the troubleshooting that that entails, you know, like without having an IT department or a tech department with them, they're just figuring out how to get really good quality video. But again, VR, I, I don't, I haven't seen anything about that. Not yet. Thank you. Okay, shifting gears a little bit. Um, how can the South Asian community play a positive role in responding to the pandemic and combating discrimination in society? Um, let's start with Kunal. Um, I think that's a great question. Um, I think uh, one thing we do at Vice really well is tell those stories and we try to tell those stories. So I think considering everything that's going on in the world right now, it's it's imperative on us that are in positions that can influence whether like, you know, I'm not saying I'm, I'm a big wig by any means, but like, you know, even if you have a small influence to shine light on, you know, the stories that deserve to be told right now. Um, a lot of what's powered me getting into this specific industry, production, entertainment, um, you know, media is that I just never really see lawyers that look like us um, ever. Like I walk into rooms, and I don't see a single one. Um, I don't know how our stories are going to be told. And I think it's really important that we have people in the room when it comes time to have those stories be told. So that, that's why, you know, I, I personally am involved in this and, and seeing everything that's going on right now, like as, as people, you know, as people of color, um, we should be leaning into helping, you know, telling, telling the stories and not shying away from it. Thank you. Kristen? Um, I mean, I think, as South Asians in general, like we, we have, you know, I take the perspective at least that we owe a debt to the black community um, and that we certainly have responsibility in no matter what area we work in to kind of engage with these discussions and, and keep, keep that debt in the forefront of our minds. And also um, to remember that while we can, we, we you know, may have experienced racism and colorism in our own communities and lives, um, that we also can't totally relate and we'll never really understand what it is to be black in this country. 
Um, and I think to that end, uh, I always approach my work in the music industry uh, kind of thinking about, A, how do I cultivate co uh, community with other South Asians in my industry? And then B, how do I use whatever tools and resources I have, whether, you know, whether I'm the biggest wig in the, in the wig pile or, or the smallest ant, um, you know, how do I use those resources not only to support um, other people of color in my industry, but also um, to support the artists that, you know, kind of work for us. I think, uh, you know, we did uh, the show Must Be Paused, which was actually started by people at, our, at Atlantic. And, and uh, I actually worked, but I was doing work for black artists. And I was like, I think that's, you know, that's, that's something that I need to do. Uh, <laughs> like, I'm not going to ignore that. <laughs> so I think that's like, you know, we're, we're, I think insofar as I'm taking the spirit of what's happening in this country and trying to apply it to my day to day life, I'm just always thinking from an advocacy perspective, which I, which I think we all do as attorneys, like, how can I be a resource? How can I be a guiding light? How can I listen better? Um, and how can I take criticism well? Thank you. Paul? Yeah, I mean, I agree with everything Kristen and Kanal said, and I think in addition to that, I think, um, you know, we need as a community, like, supporting black, the black community and just people of color in general, I think we need to set goals that are measurable and, like, discreet. Let's say, for example, one of the problems we wanted to tackle was, like, representation not necessarily at junior levels, but at higher levels in companies and law firms and, you know, partnership ranks, you know, I think we can, there's data on that, right? And we could, we could say, well, let's say we want to be wherever we are now, let's say we want to be a 2X or 3X in a couple of years. And then once we have a goal that's sort of measurable, we can implement strategies to, to work towards that. Because I think it's, it's easy to sort of like, Go, go with the flow and say the right things when the, the focus is on you, but it's harder to sort of be dedicated to it and when it's, and, and fighting the battles that are sort of like challenging, right? So um, this, the societal unrest that is sweeping the nation now is not in response to something that has, it's been going on for hundreds of years. And so why is it 2020 the year? Is it because of the pandemic? Is it a confluence of factors? I don't know. But you know, certainly as a community, we, we can be and should have been involved all along. And I think if we have goals that are measurable and we keep each other honest and, and object and we're objective about them, I think we can make more progress. And and the other aspect would be I think we gotta give back, like mentoring young lawyers, volunteering in the community, referring, you know, work to people and then also, you know, juggling. I know we're all busy, we have our jobs, we have our families, there's a lot of disruption, but I think it's important to make time to return people's phone calls and answer people's emails if they're reaching out for help or if they're getting their start because, you know, you were in that position at some point. We all were. And to uh, go on to your point about, uh, you know, mentoring and helping others, you know, what is your advice to uh, lawyers that are trying to enter your industry um, after COVID? It's, it's definitely not an easy industry to uh, get your foot in the door. So whether it be sports, entertainment or music, uh, what advice do you have? Um, well, let's start with Kristen. I think, you know, when I was trying to get my foot in the door in the music industry, um, Poonam probably remembers because it was really not a great time for law students to be looking for, for work of any kind. Like when we graduated, the numbers were really high. And, and so I think that opportunities, I, I don't know, honestly, what the economy in, in terms of like entry level jobs are going to look like in the music industry right now or in a few months. But I think I, I give the same advice to all attorneys that are kind of like looking to, uh, to do anything, which is, you know, really connect with people. I think um, how you are and, and who you are as a person matters more than your grades in all of like entertainment related industries. So if you're somebody who can connect with people well, talk to people, be honest, be genuine, be authentic, um, and also be nice. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, you really make authentic relationships with people that will take you anywhere and everywhere you want to go. Kristen, thank you so much for that uh, meaningful relationship building and, and authenticity is a huge topic nowadays. And so I, I, I definitely echo that. Um, in any industry for that matter, whether it be uh, music, entertainment, or sports. Uh, so, Kunal, uh, what do you see? 
Well, I definitely agree with everything, you know, Kristen said, like be, be authentic. Like don't, everyone knows why you're reaching out and things like that. And you'll meet, you know, you'll meet the right, the right people. Um, if you're, if you're authentic, um, otherwise you'll just be kind of drawing in the wrong people, if that makes any sense. But one thing I definitely believe in is persistence. Um, especially that's, that's anywhere, like you just said, Gio, but really in this, in this field, like, I feel like there's such a high barrier for entry into entertainment, sports, music, but once you're in, you can kind of find your way. Um, but to get over that initial barrier, you have to hit that wall like nobody else. Um, I, you know, I, I'm speaking from personal experience. Like I went, I was doing divorces when I came out of law school. It's not something I wanted to do. I hated it, but I had to pay the bills. At the same time, I was just throwing resumes at everything at everybody. And I went backwards and became a paralegal at an entertainment company in order to just get my foot in the door. Um, and then from there, I, you know, oh God, Adobe is trying to update on me. I'm sorry. Um, uh, you know, from there, I just, uh, I just kept going. I just kept hitting the wall, you know, and like a random GC at a company that I had interviewed at like a year ago hit me up and was like, you've been adequately persistent. So I'm going to throw you a bone. And that's, you know, that's how it works. Like, and then slowly by slowly, I found my way up to where I'm at now, which is at Vice, um, where we do a lot of really groundbreaking, you know, groundbreaking work. Um, it's work that I stand behind. It's work that I respect. And I can sort of you know, talk to people like Kristen and Paul on their level a, a little bit, you know, and I never thought I'd be able to do that. And um, so persistence is really, really super key with it. Thank, thank you so much, Bunal. I know, I know you're an artist, a music artist before all this. So, uh, and you still, you're still aspiring. So, uh, you know. Yeah, every uh, so, well, every so often, you know, and I, and I, and I always use that too in my interviews and things. I was like, listen, I, I can talk to creatives because I feel like I'm a better creative than I am a lawyer you know? Um, yeah. And so being able to get on their level, like just spinning things that, that are your positive, you know what I mean? 100%. 100%. And, and I, I feel like everybody's career trajectory is a little different. And thank you for your story on how you made it and, you know, taking a step back in order to take two steps forward. It's, it's, it's really inspiring. Uh, Paul, you know, I know your story is a, a, a little different. You know, you, you, you were, you started at Marvel or somewhere else. Can you tell us a little bit about what your story was and, and what advice you give uh, to other lawyers just trying to like break in right now and break that uh, glass ceiling. Sure. Well, so uh, I guess breaking in and breaking the glass ceiling are probably two different things. I, I don't know that I've broken the glass ceiling, um, but I did break in. So, you know, I started out of law school as, you know, I summered at, you know, big law, you know, white shoe firm. I wanted to do entertainment. So like Canal, you know, you send out a bunch of letters and I got an internship when I was in 3L at Marvel and I started working there and then I joined after law school and then they got bought by Disney and they, they moved me to LA. And so I was there and I spent almost like six years there. And then I decided, you know, hey, I, I skipped the whole firm thing. Why don't I try this out? And so I went to a law firm and I've had a great time at GT and the GT I think has a, has a meaningful commitment to diversity. I mean, they've gotten me involved Saba and Saba on a national level and the New York level, and they didn't hesitate to co-host this panel with, with Saba and me. So, uh, I mean, what I'd say is don't take no for an answer. Have a thick skin because there's going to be, for every opportunity, there's probably 500 people that want the job or more. And so, you know, it's just like, it's not about merit. Uh, be nice to everyone. And then I don't have to say focus on your skills. So like, let's say, what does it take to be a good lawyer? I'd say it's like, problem solving, critical thinking, um, judgment, attention to detail. Um, and, and so you have to want to do those things, whether it's entertainment, production, music, uh, tech, any, any real estate, government litigation. I mean, those skills, I think, translate across any, uh, you know, having any lawyer with those skills, I think, would do well. So if you want to do an entertainment, if you want to be in that industry, I think it helps to be passionate about it. So, you know, I'm a sports fan. I'm not as good of a musician as Canal, but it's something that, you know, I, I tried my hand at in the past. And, you know, Kristen, I can send you uh, my SoundCloud if you want. Um, but the, the key, I think, is just to not take no for an answer and to, and to just continue to improve every day if you can. Speak on panels. I mean, that's great advice. Well, and, since, <laughs> and since we're talking about Canal's music, I'm just going to throw out that Kristen's a writer on the side as well. 
Um, but oh, moving to our last question, will the current political atmosphere create a shift in how minorities are treated in your respective industries? How so, and what can minority lawyers do to help affect change? Um, let's start with Paul. So this is this is kind of there's going to be some themes. So I think we have to be objective. I think you know one thing is we could say, or any one of us could say, hey, like we quote unquote made it, we're in a good spot, we've accomplished a lot of our goals, we're sort of higher up on the hierarchy, like the Maslow hierarchy of needs. But it's not about us, right? It's about our community, it's about other communities that are suffering. So just because you might be doing it, hey, doesn't mean that you can be silent, right, about these broader issues. I think we have to check our biases, like our own biases and our biases of our coworkers. I think we have to hold people accountable. And I think it's, you know, just there's so much uh, motivation and momentum now for social change. I think we just ride that wave. And I think it's, it's we, we also have to focus on sort of like mental health in our communities and, and, and not getting bogged down in too much of the negative. So it's like, yes, there's all these challenges facing society and we live in a 24 hour news cycle from pandemic to protest to economic um, contraction. But I also think we have to try to stay positive and 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 look for the good in people, but also being objective. Thank you. Um, so, Kristen, how do you think the current political atmosphere creates a shift in how minorities are treated in the music industry, and what can minority lawyers do to help affect change? I think you know there is there's always a conversation in the music industry about how are we treating our black artists how are we engaging with the black community just because the, the music industry in particular has a long um, and complicated relationship I would you know with with black music and and the black community at large um, and I think a lot of those conversations certainly predate uh, the last three weeks um, and and people have we've especially in the last five years have kind of like looked to see how we can do more um, and be better allies. Um, and, and especially within the last three weeks, there have been even more explosive kind of conversations about how do we, um, how do we get, how do we get to a place where, where we're happy about what we're doing, A, and where we're doing the right thing. Um, and so I think, you know, there have been a lot of really interesting questions raised and a lot of really, some really positive, some, some not so positive <laughs> answers, but all in all, I think, you know, what the way that I think about it, at least on a micro level, like, like certainly like on a corporate level, Atlantic does what it does. But, but the way I think about these things is, is what can I do on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, in the scope of my work, how do I better serve, you know, the, my, my black coworkers, how do I better serve, you know, my, um, the artists that I'm engaging with in my in my roster every day um and i also think about you know uh even just as a south asian person you know what steps i can take kind of to uh to just be a better ally within my own community right um so i think uh you know as far as i mean i i forget exactly what the original question was <laughs> But, but yeah, I mean, like, there's going to be a lot of change and, and we're all trying to, I think, engage with the subject in, in different ways. And, and certainly, I think thinking, each of us thinking about how we can do good in our own day-to-day -day lives, our own workload, is half the back. If we're keeping this question in the back of our head. We will do good, right? Like, like you're thinking, how can I do good? You will do good. Thanks, Kristen. I'll, I'll repeat the question one last time for Kanal. I know it's a long one. So, will the political... <laughs> Will the political atmosphere create a shift in how minorities are treated in your industry? How so, and what can minority lawyers do to help affect change? Um, sheesh. Yeah, I, I, you know, obviously the microscope, sorry, I, the microscope is, or not the microscope, but the light is like on a lot of us now, um, which is really, you know, which is, which is really great. We get more, we get more looks now. So it's an, it's incumbent on us to be unwavering. That's what I think. Um, I'm kind of a cynic. Like, I'm, I'm a cynic. This is probably a bad way to end the panel. Like, I don't know that I see change. Like, I, I like, really, do I see it happening? I don't know. Like, that, that's, that's how I feel. But I know what I'm here for. Um, and it's to be unwavering in, like, in helping other people. Like, you know, I got in to represent 
who we are. And I got in not to cheat artists. Like that's what I've said to everybody in every interview over the course of like the last decade, everything like I want to learn. I think the artists and the creatives always get screwed first. Right. I, I think they always do. So I'm here to learn what it is and how they get screwed. And then when I'm like 60 or 70, I'm going to be that hard charging, you know, pardon my French asshole lawyer for the artist against all these companies. Like that's, that's the goal. And so I think, you know, to be unwavering and, and I think something Paul said really, really made sense earlier is, uh, to have like, just make sure we have real, uh, objective, um, I'm losing it right now, but, but, uh, Paul, do you remember what you said? Goals. I'm so sorry. Goals. Why is that such a hard word for me to remember? But, you know, like have objective goals and keep pushing and don't let anyone tell you that you're wrong, you know, because you're not. Like this stuff doesn't happen in a vacuum. It's been happening for so long and we're in a position where we can influence and you're not wrong. And you just need to keep, you know, you need to keep pushing that while we have the light on us. That's what I think. Well, well, guys, uh, I think we are uh, just three minutes over. We uh, just want to first and foremost thank uh, Greenberg Horg for uh, helping uh, put this event together, and uh, uh, our my co-moderator Poonam, uh, Paul, Kunal, Kristen. Thank you guys all, um, Edwina, and the entire uh, marketing and uh, team in uh, at Greenberg Horg. Really appreciate your help on this. And uh, you know, I know Paul and Kunal and Kristen will be sending their sound clouds and. Uh, and, their, uh, and her writing uh, it would be an email subsequent to this, uh, uh, you know, uh, just to hopefully find uh, someone who's going to pick them up as an artist or a uh, writer for that matter. All right. And then, and then they'll, they'll create an opening. They'll create an opening for new jobs in, the, in, in your respective industries, right? All right. Have exactly a good right. one, guys. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, everyone. You. Thank you, guys. Thank you.